Grace, peace, and mercy from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Be different. That's the message from our text today. That's our message from God to you today. Be different. Don't be like those people in the world around you. Don't do what they do. Be different. That's what God was telling the children of God, Israel, in our Old Testament text today. They were camping at Mount Sinai. God had just brought them out of bondage, brought them out of Egypt, rescued them from Pharaoh. He promised them their own land, a good land where they could live in peace. But when you get there, he says, be different. Don't do what the people of Egypt did. And don't do what the people of this new land do. Don't worship the gods of Egypt. Don't worship the gods of this new land. Be different. And then he goes on to tell them in detail how. God says, don't reap the fields right up to the edge. Don't strip your vineyards clean. Leave some. Leave some for the poor and for the needy. Go ahead, take 80 or 90%. You can have that, but leave some. Leave some for the poor, for those in need, for I am the Lord. And then he goes on to say, don't idolize the almighty denarius. Don't oppress your neighbor. Don't cheat or steal or take him to court for a buck. And don't become possessed by revenge when you are wronged. If someone shortchanges you in some way, whether it's by money or by reputation or whatever, relax. I'm giving you land. I'm giving you a home of your own. I'm still taking care of you. Don't sin because someone sins against you. I am the Lord. And don't take advantage of the deaf or of the blind. Be different. Don't be like everyone else. Don't be like the world, because you're not. You're mine, says the Lord. I brought you up out of Egypt. I brought you up out of bondage. I brought you through the Red Sea. I am the Lord your God, so act like it. You're special because you are. You're rich because you are. And this world that's around you, don't act like it. Don't be like it. It's not for you. It won't last. You're different because you are. I am the Lord, he says. Now, sometimes when we hear that term, I am the Lord, I think we hear it like a child when they question why their parents want them to do something. And they'll say, why? Why do I have to do it? And parents will often say, because I told you to. Why does Israel have to do these things? Because I am the Lord. Because I am the Almighty. Because I'm the Sovereign. I'm the Rule Maker. I am God. I'm the Boss. Except that's not how God means this at all. I am the Lord. It's like the invocation that we just said, that we do at the beginning of services. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've mentioned this in Bible class some time ago, that that phrase is actually not a sentence. It's a prepositional phrase. It's only part of the sentence, and the other part is really important. The rest of it is, I baptize you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The invocation is a reminder that who we are and what God has done for us. As a baptized child of God, you've been washed in the waters. You've been covered in the blood of the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And your sins are forgiven and you are saved. You are a child of God. A child of the Heavenly Father. To be with Him, to walk with Him, to know Him, to talk to Him. And that makes you special because you are, because his name was given to you in baptism and placed upon you. We are different. 
And so Israel is different. I am the Lord is only part of a sentence for them. Their job is to finish that statement to show that they understand. It's a reminder of who God is. I am the Lord, the God who has taken you out of bondage, out of Egypt to a better place. I am the Lord who walked you through the Red Sea and drowned your captives or drowned your enemy. I am the Lord who has given you a new home, a good land. And all those words are gospel, not law. This is what God is doing for them, has done for them. And not because of what we do, not because of how we act, but because of who he is. And they mark Israel as different because they are, they are the Lord's. So act that way, he says. The very next words after the invocation that we speak in the divine service is, I haven't. We confess that we haven't lived differently than the world, that we have sinned and thought word and deed by what we've done and left undone. We've done what they have done. We say what they have said. And we've even worshiped the almighty denarius. We have worshiped money. Yes, we really have. We've done it at the expense of our prayers and our devotions and our families. We've been stingy with the poor and the needy. And we think of ourselves first. And it's really interesting to me that people like sports stars, politicians, the rich, the powerful, the high and the mighty, the famous and well-known, what happens to them? The masses idolize them. They become idols because they are. They're made into idols. And they become what we try to be and walk on each other to be. And a child of God? Oh yeah, well, I'm that too, but that's not enough. I want more, I need more, I deserve more, I'm going to get more. Oh well, Lord, have mercy on me, a poor, miserable sinner. And Israel had to confess that same thing. That's why Moses went up onto Mount Sinai. God didn't just give him the Ten Commandments there, but also the tabernacle which was the place where you could find the forgiveness of God. The place where God would show mercy to them. And that place made all the difference too. Not only what God was doing for them, but God was with them. He was caring for them. He was dwelling with them and forgiving them. And because of that, they could turn around and care for and forgive others. The poor, the needy, the deaf, the blind, and their neighbor, because I am the Lord. Because they have a good and gracious Lord caring for them and forgiving them. So they were different. And you are different. You are forgiven. So act that way. Not because it's a law. And that you have to please God and make up for all your sins. No, because you are free to be different. You've been set free, receiving mercy and forgiveness. So now live that way. And what might that look like to be different because we are? Well, it might look like the Good Samaritan, which is a parable. And I think one that is often misunderstood as the phrase, I am the Lord. Just as I am the Lord is not God requiring something from you. So the Good Samaritan is not a parable telling us all to be Good Samaritans, but teaching that we actually have one. You see, this lawyer came up to Jesus to test him that day. What do I need to do to receive eternal life? He just wanted to know what it was, what the cost was. And even though Jesus didn't use a lawyer in this parable, 
he did use a couple of friends of lawyers, a priest and a Levite. And I wonder if possibly this lawyer that was in such a hurry to come and see Jesus to ask this question, if maybe he didn't do just what the Good Samaritan did on his way there. Maybe he was one of those people that crossed over to the other side. It would not be beyond Jesus to talk in this way, to know that. So he asked Jesus a question. Now, it would have been nothing for Jesus to turn around and say, Mr. Lawyer, what you should have done was stop and help that guy in the ditch that you passed by on the other side because you were in such a hurry to come here and ask me how you could have salvation when God has already prepared it for you and there's nothing you can do for it. You should have stopped and helped this man because you can. And the only thing Jesus could have ended with at that point was, I am the Lord. But if he had, it could have meant two things. First, I am the Lord who spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai and did all those things for Israel and made such great and precious promises to them. I am that Lord. And second, I am the Lord who has come now to fulfill them all for you, to be your good Samaritan because you, Mr. Lawyer, can't. You're the guy in the ditch. And you, my fellow redeemed, you all, are the guy in the ditch. Beat up, robbed of your life by your sins, by death and by the devil. And what good would it do to yell at the man, now get up, save yourself, heal yourself, clean yourself up. Wouldn't do much good, would it? You see, that man needed something. He needed somebody. He needed saving. Now, after this guy in the ditch was saved, after he recovered and got better, what do you think the months and weeks looked like following that? The next time he was walking down the road and saw a man in the ditch, do you think he stopped, looked around and wondered? Where is that good Samaritan when you need him? Or do you think he was different? Do you think he did likewise, doing so unto others as was done unto him? Not because he had to, but because he could. Because he knows what it's like to lie in a ditch and watch people walk by and not care. He knew. So every week, this church is filled with people in the ditch. The devil, the world, and your own sinful nature have attacked at you and inflicted moral wounds upon you. And maybe you've done so to others intentionally or unintentionally, known or unknown. Wounds that if not treated will lead to death. And we confess and we cry out for help. And our good Samaritan is here and comes down to be in the ditch with us just like he did some 2,000 years ago, when he came down and was attacked and beaten, and not just left for dead, but was really killed with your death, with your grave, because of your sin. But he was not a victim of death. He was a victor over death, because he is your savior and came for that reason to rescue us all from the grip of sin and death and hell by coming to get us, washing us, feeding us, and putting us on his back and saving us. And he still does right here. And he calls us different, and we are. We're healed, we're whole, we're saved, we're forgiven. So live that. Act that way. Be different. You have been saved because you are. You see, the Christian life isn't one of asking, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? Or what must I do to be saved? You have eternal life right now. 
You have been saved. Jesus did that for you. You've been unditched. You've been lifted up and lifted out and oiled and wined and healed and re restored. And you've been given a new life. So now the Christian life is a joyous life. One of jumping down into the ditches no matter who's in it to unditch them. And there's plenty of ditches if you take the time and are not too busy to see them or too preoccupied with everything going on around you, with all your own stuff. People in ditches at work or in at school or your friends, your neighbors, maybe your social medias, be different for them. And by being different for them, you will be the same as Jesus was for you. The one whose steadfast love endures forever, as we sang moments ago in the intro, it, whose love and forgiveness and grace and gifts and mercy will never run out. Dare to be different. Dare to live as one saved by grace alone through faith alone and not by what you do. Dare to live the gospel in all your life. Dare to believe that this is true. That it is he who defines who you are and makes you who you are. Because I am the Lord, he says, who has done everything for you. I am the Lord who has brought you through the waters of holy baptism. Where you were not only saved there, but where your guilt and your sin were slain. I am the Lord who feeds you not with manna but with bread that is my very body and with wine that is my blood. I am the Lord. So go, you be different. Go, you are mine. Go, you are unditched. Go, you are free and all your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, you have Jesus' word on it and he is the Lord in Jesus' name holy name. Amen and amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Will you please rise for the offertory?